When you go to God in prayer about uh, a struggle that you're having, and often if it's an internal struggle especially, do you arise from that prayer with the words hallelujah coming off of your lips? Or is it the idea of, well, I'll wait and see if things change? Because when we go through the, the scriptures, one thing I, I believe is a, a pattern throughout the scriptures is that prayer is meant to be a resolution in many instances. But it's not the resolution that we're always looking for. And so tonight we're going to be looking at that and asking that really important question is what is your prayer really like? What's your prayer life really about? And is it something that gives you peace and comfort as, as God desires? I appreciate the presence of each one tonight. We've got a good number in attendance. I know we still have a lot of people who are out of town. We have visitors with us. It's good to have you. If there's anything that you need of a spiritual nature, we'd love to be able to sit down and, and talk with you about those things. If you want to keep your Bibles open to that passage in 1 Peter, we're going to be looking at a few more verses just prior to that in just a moment. But one of the things that I also want to do with this lesson is instead of having just the three words, it's going to be three phrases. And so if you're ready for these three phrases, hold your notebooks up high. Very good. Okay. Now, these three phrases, I'm going to go one at a time through them because I believe that this is something that would be beneficial. I want this to be very applicable to our lives. And so if you're not used to taking notes, maybe you will make a mental note or write in your phone these three phrases. And I think this could be a really good pattern for your prayer life. And so the first word, and this is some of the things that we're going to be talking about. The first word is, I feel. That what we're going to notice in the scriptures, primarily from the Psalms tonight, is that many of the Psalms are written in a pattern. That the psalmist, especially in the early verses, will really talk about the way in which he feels about something, the emotional struggle that he's going through, the physical uh, problems that he is encountering, the way in which people are afflicting him or his enemies are surrounding him, and how that makes him even sometimes feel like he is abandoned by God. And so they will first talk about the way in which he feels, but then he will put that in opposition to the things that he actually knows, that I know God is, I know the Lord will, I know that I have been promised or it's been told to me, and he'll go through a list of several things from his memory or from things that God has promised he will do in the future. And he will look at that. So then you have those two things that are being talked about, the things that he feels and the things that he knows. And if you really think about it, that is the, the thing that causes us so much internal turmoil often is that, is that I feel one way, but I also know something else. And because of that, there's a, a conflict. It's much like Romans 7 when Paul talks about the things I want to do are not the things that I do. And there's this struggle going on between the carnal man and the fleshly man. And so then what the psalmist does at the end of many of the psalms is this. He makes an I will statement. I will do this. I am going to do this. And he'll say what his resolve is going to be. And so when you go through the Psalms, and remember that when you go through the Psalms, they are extremely emotional. It's one of the reasons why I actually avoided the Psalms for a long time, because of they, they were so emotional. And that was to my detriment, that we need to be in the Psalms. And we need to see how it is that these struggles that people are going through are very real struggles. But how do you come to a resolution from that? What does God mean when he says, cast all your cares upon me? I care for you. Cast your burdens on me because I'm not going to allow you to be shaken. I'm not going to allow you to be moved. How does that happen when we do, as I asked a moment ago, arise from prayer or say that amen at the end of a prayer? And there is no resolution that I feel. There is no finality to the situation. There is no what's the outcome going to be to what I'm going through. I think prayer is meant to be more than that. And I think that's something that we'll bear out as we go through the lesson. So let's go back there to the passage that was read for us in 1 Peter and back up in the context to verse 12 of chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Notice if you can see these three things. The things that Peter is talking about, the feelings of the brethren, the things that brethren are to know, and the things that brethren are to do as a result. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. So he addresses a few of it there. There's trials, there's tribulations, there's trouble, there's a fiery trial that's trying them. But don't think it's strange. Put that in just position to the things that you actually know. Then he tells them what they should do. But rejoice. Why? To the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Again, the thing that we know is partaking of Christ's sufferings. But again, the thing you feel is that it is suffering. 
that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. It doesn't feel blessed, but you are blessed. For the spirit of the glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as, an, as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God in this matter. That is the I will. I will glorify God in this matter. I will not be ashamed. For the time, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who, who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. And as you go through that, and we're going to do this exercise as we go through several psalms tonight, you see that God wants us to lay our burdens on him, to let him know what we're experiencing, what we're going through, what our burden is, what we feel about that. But also understand and, and to reiterate and, and even say what it is that I know. That's why I ask you to use these three phrases, that when you go to God in prayer, keeping a journal or a notebook, or just before you say the prayer, maybe writing down what it is that you want to say, what it is that you're wanting to accomplish in that prayer, and write out at the very beginning that this is what I am feeling. This is what I'm going through. This is how I feel about this situation. And being brutally honest about it, because God already knows what you're going through. There's no reason to hide it. He knows what's in your heart. He knows the burden that you have. He wants you to put that on him. So how do you do that? First, you have to tell him what it is that you feel. But then the way in which you secure your faith is by stating what it is that I actually know. And knowing that there is a conflict between those two things, what I feel but what I know. And then make a resolution. And when we come to the end of the lesson today, when we talk about resolution, I pray that it is something that when we arise from prayer, we feel peace. We feel security. But go with me to Philippians chapter 4 as well. And this passage that I know that we have read many times and we've had sermons about and we talk about constantly. It's probably something that's written in your house somewhere because of the struggles that we've often had in prayer. Philippians 4, 6 through 9. This is on page 1060 in the Pew Bible. Philippians 4 and starting at verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Even in those early verses, you see the way in which they feel. There is anxiety. And the scriptures say, let it not be there. Don't be anxious about anything. But you are anxious. And there's no peace. Because the peace of God is promised to guard your hearts and minds. He tells you what you're supposed to do in verse 8. Meditate on what's true, noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there's anything of virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. These things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, Paul says, do these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Again, when we go through the Psalms, they are, they are very, very emotional in nature, and, and it just takes a casual reading of several of the psalms to see some of the things that are talked about throughout the psalms. Psalm 6, verses 6 and 7, I am weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. My eyes waste away because of grief. It grows old because of my enemies, of all my enemies, he says. And so the psalmist is talking about the sorrow and the misery that he is going through and how his tears drench his bed during the night. Psalm 22, that we know is a prophecy concerning the Savior, but also the psalmist, as he writes this, is going through. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season, and I'm not silent. He says, I'm constantly calling out to God and the physical and spiritual agony that he's going through. And he asked God the question, why is it that you've forsaken me? He feels alone. He feels abandoned, even by God himself. Psalm 51, where David is uh, going through the repentance, and he talks about the, the grief and anguish that he is going through because of his sin and the remorse that he has. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned 
and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. That as you go through the Psalms, you see how it is that they express their feelings so openly and freely, even in, in times of confusion and darkness. Asaph in Psalm 73 says, But as for me, my feet almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Who are the wicked? 12 through 14. Behold, these are the ungodly or the wicked who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. He says and begins to even wonder by being honest with God, have I wasted time living for God? Have I just wasted my life? These wicked, these people don't go through the same kinds of things that I'm going through, and yet I do. I'm trying to serve God, and I don't know why, is what he is saying in those psalms. When you go through this, one thing that we see is that it's genuine expressions of their feelings. How it is that they actually feel, what they're actually going through and experiencing. And you can see how that causes great conflict within us, because we are people of God. We know the power of God. We know the promises of God. We know what it is that God has offered and extended to mankind. But the problem is, that's not how I feel at that moment. And so that's what the psalmist next turn to often. And we're going to go through some of these same psalms once again and notice what happens. As I said a moment ago, internal conflict is often caused by that disconnect between what it is that we're feeling and what it is that we actually know. And notice how the psalmist resolves, start, begins to resolve these things. Psalm 73, where he said, Am I serving God in vain? Is it for nothing? This is how he begins that psalm. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as is pure in heart. Is that how he feels about it, though? That's how the psalm begins. He begins with what it is that he knows about God. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as is pure in heart. And any one of us would say amen to that statement. But then he says, my foot almost slipped because I looked around at the wicked and what's going on and what they're getting away with and, and how it is that they seem to be prospering and they, they don't worry about things. They don't, they don't seem to be anxious about nothing. Even when they die, there's no pain in it as there is for the rest of us. But truly God is good to Israel. That's what he knows, but that is not what he's feeling as he goes through that psalm. So how do we resolve that? Psalm 22, we saw a few moments ago. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But then, in verse 3, this is what he knows. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. And he knows this. He looks back to the past and he says, Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted in you, delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But what did he say right before this? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Our fathers trusted, our fathers believed, you, you delivered them, you rescued them, but why have you forsaken me? I know what you have done, but this is how I feel. I feel like you've abandoned me, and why? It's much like Job, when Job was talking with his friends and all these different arguments and situations are going about, that, that Job's argument is very just in many ways because he says, I I've, I've, haven't done anything wrong. I haven't sinned against God. I haven't abandoned God. But it very much feels like God has abandoned me. And why? What is the reason for this? What's the cause behind it? Because that's the way that it feels. And when we have these moments where there's a struggle going on, it does feel that way. You feel like you've been abandoned by God. Why did my loved one pass? Why did I get this disease? Why am I suffering as, as, as other people do not suffer? Why am I going through this? God, I know who you are. I know what you've done in the past. But why is this happening to me? Why do I feel this way? Other places we can go. Psalm 56 and verse 9. Sometimes the conflict is resolved just because of knowing what it is that we understand. Psalm 56 and verse 9. Here he's talking about being able to find peace even when he's surrounded by his enemies. That when I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. 
It's the idea of, of coming to a resolution just because I know what's going to happen. I know that my enemies are going to be turned back because God is for me. That I know that's what's going to happen. But again, that's not the way that you're going to feel. And, and again, it's the same lesson that we had from this morning and we often have is that emotions are not the things that determine truth. Truth is something that is steady. Truth is something that is always run to because it is the, the uh, cornerstone of everything else. Truth is the standard that does not change. Truth is something that is not manipulated by time, space, power, authority. Nothing can change it. Truth is truth, period. And so what we're always doing is taking what it is that we feel, what it is that's going on around us, and we have to lay it side by side with what the truth is and recognize that there's a difference between those two things. The truth is God is for me, but that is not how I'm feeling right now. So which one of those are correct? Has God abandoned you or is God for you? That's when you go back to what you know. You know truth is truth. You know God is for you. So this feeling of abandonment is not real. That's a feeling, and you're not always going to feel that feeling. It can grow worse, or it can get better. But the truth is the truth. God is for you. And that's what the psalmist is relying upon as he's going through these struggles and as he faces these different situations, when he feels even forsaken by others. In Psalm 140, verse 12, I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. I know that. I know that that's what God's going to do. I know that's who God is. And we try to manipulate and change things as much as, as we want to, but that is the truth, that that is who God is. And he does it in his own way and in his own time. Notice all three of these in Psalm 56. Once again, Psalm 56. We read verse 9 a few moments ago, but now look at verses 8 through 11 that it's in the midst of. Notice how he feels. You number my wanderings. Put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? The psalmist is hurting. He knows that he has cried enough tears to fill up a bottle. And he asks God to look at the tears that are in the bottle that God knows about. He knows how much he has cried. When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know, because God is for me. And then he says, in God, I will praise his word. In the Lord, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? He brings about that resolution that we've been talking about. He says his I will statement, I will not be afraid. He's surrounded by enemies. Tears could fill up a bottle in God's hand. His bed has been drenched with them, as we've seen in other Psalms. He has cried out day and night. He looks to what it is that he knows and he makes this resolution, I will not be afraid. I have been afraid, I feel afraid, I have weeped and, and cried because of my enemies, but I am no longer going to be afraid. God, I know who you are. I trust you. Again, the Psalms are so very emotional and they are filled with people laying out their burdens and, and their calls for grief and God is inviting it. Cast all your care upon me because I care for you is what God says. Your children will be afraid in the middle of the night because they've been awakened by this dream of something that is not real about creatures that do not exist and you want them to tell you about their dream, to tell you about the scary monster, to tell you about the thing in the closet that's under their bed. And you know it's not real, that the truth is it does not exist, but that doesn't change the way that child feels. And you still want that child to tell you what it is so that you can let them know, I am here for you and I will not let those things hurt you. And you know you have it within the power to do so because they don't exist. God is for you. What can man do to you? Because even if he takes your life, what has he done? It's difficult to have that perspective. And so again, having, having it written down may be something that could be helpful. To write down how you really feel. To be brutally honest with God. Stop trying to hide it from him. But then also write down what it is that you know for a fact. Something that is outside of yourself something that is based upon God and not the emotions. Lay them side by side. This is true. This is how I feel. This is how I feel, but this is the truth. Then what do you do? How do we resolve that? And how is it going to meet us the way it should? Psalm 73, again, you can see all three of these things at work. 
when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. The psalmist even says that the process is not going to be easy. It's not one that's going to be fun. It's not entertaining. When I thought how to understand it, it was too painful. But then he says, until I went to the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery, slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awakens. So, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. The psalmist was having difficulty understanding. But he brings it to a beautiful conclusion, a resolution to that conflict that was going on within him. That nothing had changed about his situation. Everything was exactly the same as it was before, except for one thing. He had gone into the sanctuary of God, and he changed. And that's the resolution that's supposed to be there. There's, the things in life are going to be the things of life. The world's going to keep on spinning time and chance and, and hardship and difficulties. They're always going to be around us. That is a fact. But when I go into the sanctuary of God, it reminds me of something, that I've been having the wrong perspective. I've been looking at things from a, a fleshly, a mortal perspective. And the truth is, I am nothing but dust. The truth is, I'm weak. The truth is, as David says, I, I'm a sinful man. I need my sins blotted out. The truth is, I, I am frail and I, I get sick. I get diseases. I, I lose loved ones because of sorrow and grief that we have just living in this world that's filled with such. But the truth is this, when I go into the sanctuary of God, it, it humbles me. It, it forces me to think more about God than I do about myself. It tells me to, to trust in Him and don't be consumed and concerned about everything else that's in the world. I can't control any of it. I have no power over it. But I can trust in the one who has all power and the one who is on my side for all eternity. I think we even see this when we turn to the New Testament and we think about our Savior. In Mark 14, 36, read that, and can you not see what Jesus knows, what Jesus feels, what Jesus will do? Even in our Savior's own prayer, he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Jesus states what it is that he knows. But how does our Savior feel? Take this cup away from me. He knows the, the weight of drinking that cup. He knows what he's about to face. He feels the pressure that comes with that. His sweat becomes like great drops of blood because of the anxiety that he feels at this time. But I know God, I know Father, everything is possible for you. So what's going to change about Jesus' situation? Nothing. Nevertheless, not as I will. But this is Jesus' I will statement. I will do what you need me to do. It is difficult to arise from prayer for, with that type of resolute heart and mind. That even our Savior went through it and experienced it. And it should be a lesson for us as well on how to deal with it. So let's talk a little bit about making a resolution. Making those I will statements. What is it that I will do? Because when you go through the I wills statements in the Psalms, and that's how many of the Psalms will bring themselves to a conclusion, it has to do with the decision that they're going to make. Psalm 22, once again, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? is how it began. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. And yet none of his circumstances have changed. You have answered me. He's still surrounded by his enemies. You have answered me, but he's still in the same situation that made him say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You have answered me. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. He encourages others, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried out to him, he heard. And so again, we know what Psalm 22 is talking about. 
We know that it's looking forward to the Savior, the Messiah, and how it is that he is going to feel forsaken. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's got all these enemies. He has all these piercings. He has all these people wagging the tongue at him. He has all this desperation in this moment. But what is he going to know? That he is not forsaken. That God has not left him. That God has not turned his back on him. That God has not looked away in shame and embarrassment of the one that is hanging upon the tree. None of those things exist. None of those things are real. This is what is real. God heard him, and God let him bear the cross, and God let him die because he had not forsaken him. That's what's so hard and difficult. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. I am going to praise you. You know how to answer my prayer. You have answered my prayer. I don't know what the answer is necessarily, but I know you've answered it. I'm not one who particularly believes that God says no to our prayers. I know we don't get what we want, but I don't think that's a no. I think that is God answering your prayer. You don't need that, or you don't need that right now. I'm not going to give that to you, but it doesn't mean that God hasn't answered your prayer. Would it be that God did not answer the prayer of Jesus? Here it says he did answer his prayer. And sometimes that is the answer. It's my will that needs to be done, not yours. And so what do we do in those moments? It's not what I want. It's not what I'm asking for. It's not the deliverance I've been looking for. It's not the answer to the questions I've been asking. It still makes me feel abandoned and, and left alone in my grief and in my sorrow. We go to Psalm 55, where our scripture reading actually came from tonight in that context. Psalm 55 is about the psalmist going through a horrible situation it's about a heartbreaking betrayal by a friend of the psalmist. He says, for it is not an enemy who reproaches me. Then I could bear it. He would understand if it was somebody that was his enemy that had treated them this way. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me. He says, then I could hide from him. And so he says this, he says, it is somebody that I know. It is my close companion. We went together, he says, in the throng of the situations and the turmoil that's going on, it's my companion and my acquaintance, a man my equal that he's going through this situation with. And he says, I can't hide from this. Because that's often what we'd want to do. We want to hide from the situation, remove ourselves from the, the circumstances. He says, I can't do that. This is my own friend who has done this, my companion and my friend. We took sweet counsel together, he says. But in verse 16, he says, As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. In verse 23, he says, But you, O God, shall bring them down to the pit of destruction. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. Sometimes that's all we have. I will trust in you. I can't hide from it, I can't run from it, it is all, all around me and there's nothing I can do except this, and praise God for this, but I will trust in you. That's what it's supposed to be about. That's what resolution in prayer is supposed to be about, is that I know things may not change, that I'm not going to instantly have a bigger bank account, I'm not going to start growing younger. I'm not going to start having no health issues. I'm not going to, none of these things that are going on in life are going to change. Prayer is not about changing the situation. Prayer is about changing us. I will trust in you. And so this is the pattern that we see throughout the Psalms. This is how I feel. This is how I know what I know. This is what I will do. And often the only resolution to it, and this is what I believe God wants most of all, I will trust you. You will answer. You have already answered. You will deliver. You will punish the wicked. You will save the righteous. All is going to be according to how you want it to be. And I'm fine with that because I know your way is the best. That's what Jesus arose from his prayer with. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And that should be our resolution. 
to those prayers. Psalm 77. Psalm 77 is a very bleak psalm. It's about the present being very, very dark. And there is not really anything about the future that's promising in the psalm. But right here in the middle of it says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. It sounds a lot like Philippians 4, 6 through 9. To be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplications, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Meditate on these things. I will remember the works of the Lord. I will remember the wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. That's how we have the God of peace that is with us. When we resolve these things in prayer. Psalm 66, 10 through 15. Notice how God even puts people through situations. For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. But you brought us out to rich fulfillment. That is amazing to me. That he says, you, O oh God, have tested us by putting us through all these things. And yes, they deserved most of this because of the sins they had committed. And even as it seems to be in reference to them coming out of Egyptian bondage, how God had even punished his people through that and had them go through difficulties in that bondage. But you brought us out to rich fulfillment. So this is what I will do. I will go into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay my vows, which my lips have uttered and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer you burnt sacrifices of fat animals with a sweet aroma of rams. I will offer bulls with goats. In other words, I know how much I owe God. That even in the midst of the problem and the situation, I still realize this. I owe God everything. This could be trials that are time and chance. This could be trials because of my own sin or, or, or falling short. This could be something that God is just testing me. I don't know. I know how it makes me feel, but this is what I know. God's not trying to destroy me, even though it feels like, and I know what it feels like to have people's feet walking across my head. I know how, what that's like, to go through the fire and the water. But I also know this, and in times past, what has God done? He's brought them out. And he didn't just bring them out, but he brings them out to rich fulfillment. I know this is what God has done, and I know God is for me. He's not trying to destroy me. So what am I going to do? I'm going to give God everything that I have. I'm going to continue to worship. I'm going to continue to offer sacrifices. I'm going to continue to do the things that I have promised God that I am going to do. Because that's what life is about. And I know that God is rich and rewarding in the end. As Romans 12, verse 1, we're going to conclude with this. Romans 12, verse 1. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It is really about letting God have everything. It's about giving God what it is that I can, because I know that I owe him much more than I could ever repay. And so, again, I think this is something that can help us in our prayer life. It's something that I think will help me in my prayer life, to be brutally honest with what's going on. Lay it on the table. God already knows it. You need to see it. Put out there what God has said and what God has done. The promises that God has made. The things that you do know. And then what are you going to do? You're going to trust in how you feel? Or are you going to trust in God who delivers? And make that resolution. And so the, the question I'm going to leave with you tonight is this one. Is your prayer life resolving your conflicts? Is it something that you do arise from, as we sang just a few moments ago, that when you say that amen at the end of your prayer, can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Or do you still feel bewildered and lost? If you're struggling with that, we want to help. I know this is something that a lot of people have difficulty with. If you need help with that, let us know. Let the eldership know so that we can sit and, and talk with you, study with you, and help you through that situation. We're brothers and sisters. And we are here for one another. If you haven't become a Christian, if you know that you need to be baptized so that your sins can be washed away, everything that's needed for that is, is ready. And we stand ready to help you in any way we can. As together we stand and sing, please come if we can be of service to you.